Hey, Miss Apps. Hope you guys are having a great day. Um, today we're moving on to Chapter 4, Section 2, Day 2 of the Practice of Statistics, 4th edition. And uh, we're going to talk about how to experiment well. Um, there are three principles of experimental design, things that are absolutely necessary for you to have a well-designed experiment, um, which is different than an observational study, remember. Um, so uh, by the end of today, we're going to talk about what those are. You should understand why they're important. And um, we sh you should be able to understand what a completely randomized design for an experiment is. Um, so make a note that most of the terminologies, um, terminology that we've used up to this point have been um, about sampling um, and selecting people for um, typically for observational studies. Um, and the experimental terminology is different than that of observational studies. So uh, we're going to, I'll be comparing a little bit because um, there's some similarities and some differences, but the terminology is different. So you want to make sure that you're using the appropriate terms. Um, so the first principle of experimental design is control. Um, and control, as this says, it, um, it provides a baseline for comparing the effect of the treatment to the other groups. Um, the control group does not get the treatment, um, or maybe they get a placebo, uh, like a sugar pill or something. Um, and the idea with control is you need to have something to compare the results to. So say, for example, you wanted to know if introducing yoga to students at Dawson helped them relax. Um, if you did that for every single student, you wouldn't be able to compare um, those results to uh, another group. All you would know is like, let's say for example, that it actually worked and like people were feeling better by the end of the program. You wouldn't necessarily know that it's because of the yoga. Like maybe something else happened in that same time period. Like maybe we, um, like the entire school changed something that would also affect the level of stress. Or maybe we did the experiment during um, Christmas vacation, um, a holiday vacation, and so everybody kind of de-stressed over the holiday anyways, and so they were less stressed afterwards. Um, you won't know that unless you have a control group, so you would need to have like part of the school, like a certain group of students taking yoga, and some of the students not taking yoga, um, so that you can compare like, oh yeah, the yoga group was under the same conditions except for yoga. Um, and they seem calmer, and they seem cool, and they, you know, so yay, it worked. Um, so control is super, super, super important. Number two is randomization, okay? Now, in the previous lesson, previous couple of lessons, we've talked about random selection um, and random sampling, so like a simple random sample, um, and using randomness to select people. This is a little bit different. You're still using randomization. Um, but instead of selecting people randomly, you have to assign treatments randomly. So like in the previous example, you've got yoga people and yo not yoga students. Um, the, the students who get yoga were selected randomly for that particular treatment. Um, so, you know, in this case, everybody is in one, in one of the groups, so like you could, um, flip a coin for every student, and if they get heads, they go into the yoga group, and if they get tails, they go into the uh, non-yoga group. Um, the only problem with that is you will not have, not necessarily have equal groups. If you want equal groups, then you list students from 1 to 300 and randomly select 50, 150 of them to go to uh, the yoga group and the rest go to the non-yoga group. Okay, so you need to assign the treatments randomly. You do not need random selection, you just need random assignment. Um, and basically this helps create a roughly equivalent groups of experimental units and, and subjects. So the idea is if you use randomness, the idea is your yoga group and your non-yoga group have generally the same like makeup. Um, so maybe you have like, in both groups, you have people who regularly do yoga and who regularly meditate and who regularly um, are super stressed out. But you have all of those variables in both groups. 
And so what that does is it actually helps reduce the effect of those variables that might otherwise confound your results. So um, the randomness helps a lot. And lastly is the, um, you need replication. So you need to do the experiment on many subjects or many experimental units. Like you have to have um, a lot of data, otherwise like one person being calmer after a study do with yoga like has no weight at all. But if you have like 500 people and like 95% of them you know, suggest that they, or like it suggests that they feel calmer after doing yoga for three weeks or whatever. Um, that's significant. So you want to like be able to have the replication and then the numerical data um, and quantity of data to be able to validate your conclusions. Okay, lastly um, is a completely randomized design. Um, and so this is it's important to understand what a completely randomized design is in terms of experiment speak because um, a lot of experiments are done this way. Um, in the next video, I believe, we're going to talk about um, blocking and basically that's like, it's like an organized way to set up your groups. It's kind of like stratification. Um, but a completely randomized design for an experiment is basically the equivalent of a simple random sample um, when you're sampling. So the idea is, you know, you have a group of people who either volunteered for your survey, or sorry, not volunteered for your survey, volunteered for your experiment, or um, you selected for the experiment, whatever it may be. Um, and then you literally just assign them all numbers, or put their names in a hat, and select half of them to go to the yoga group and half of them to go to the non-yoga group or half of them to go to the placebo group and half of them to go to the actual medication group, whatever your experiment is. Um, and maybe you have more than two groups. You may have two separate treatments and a third control group and so maybe you have three groups. Um, and so the idea with this is you literally, um, you're just kind of pooling from the entire group of people or um, or, you know, set of subjects, experimental units that you want to experiment on, um, and you're literally just randomly selecting them for each treatment. Um, this is essentially the same thing as a simple random sample for observational studies, um, but is terminology for an experiment. It's completely randomized design. You are not sampling randomly necessarily for experiments. Experiments don't need to have um, random sampling, like your people don't need to be selected randomly. Typically they're not. Um, you usually, like I don't know if you listen to the radio or anything, but like you'll hear, um, we're looking for people who have trouble sleeping for a sleep study. Um, and you can actually like volunteer for studies and they'll put you into either the treatment group or the placebo group. Um, and a lot of times you actually get money for being um, participating in, in experiments like that um, because it takes a lot of time and energy for you to like participate. Um, but they are voluntary typically. Um, so you don't have the random sample, but you do have the random assignment. So everybody's like randomly going into the different treatment groups and the control groups. Um, and then last, Side note, um, for your AP exam, uh, just an AP tip, is that usually um, you people lose points if they don't truly describe um, how they're going to assign the treatments to the, to the subjects or the experimental units. Um, so basically, you have to be able to write out the experiment as you would do it and hand it to somebody else who has like minimal knowledge of statistics. Um, I always like to think of like freshmen, you know? I'm like, if I can hand this piece of paper to a freshman and they could actually do it, then you're good to go. Um, but if they would look at it and they'd be like, well, I don't understand what you're saying. Um, 
you need to give some more details. So, you know, include all the information that, that um, you would need in order to replicate your experiment without you there. Um, so, uh, whoops, <laughs> we have a couple uh, examples um, for you to try. I'm gonna pull those up real quick. Okay, so go ahead, read example one, uh, and go ahead and try this on your own. Um, recall that we talked about response variables and explanatory variables in a past video. So if you need to refresh those, go back and do that. Okay, so here um, you can take a look at how I wrote out the, uh, the way that I had assigned them to treatments. I'd probably label the subjects 1 to 30, and then using a random number generator or table, select 15 individuals. Um, those first 15 that you select will be fed her product, and the other 15 will be fed the competitor's product. That way, everybody has the same chance of being selected for either group. Um, the response variable will be the weight gain of the child, um, and the explanatory variable is the type of food that they get. Um, here is the second example. Go ahead and give that one a try. So this one's pretty similar. You label the one acre plots um, 1 to 20. And then using a random number generator table, select 10 plots of land. Those will be given the new fertilizer. The other 10 are given the old fertilizer. The response variable is like what the response is. So that's like the number of bushels harvested at the end. Um, and the explanatory variable is the type of fertilizer that was used. And we have one more example here. Um, go ahead, read that. Give that one a try. Okay, this one I went a little bit different. And I said just... I could have done it the other way um, that I did in example one and two, but this one I just uh, put the names of all the students who volunteered on equal size sheets of paper and put them in a popcorn bucket instead of a bowl or a hat. I don't know. That's my popcorn. That's a really bad, bad picture of popcorn. Anyways, mix them well, select 25 students to take the online course from the popcorn bowl. Um, and the other 25 take the in-class course. Uh, and then at the end, compare the SAT results um, and see who tended to do better. So the interesting thing is about the randomization, um, you could, in theory, on accident, just by random chance, put all of the really, really smart people in one group and all the really, really, really not smart people in another group. Um, and that would skew the, the results. But the idea is with the randomization, um, it reduces the likelihood that that's going to happen and you're going to have like all level abilities um, in both groups and you're going to have people who learn a lot in either group and a lot and people who don't learn a lot in the other group. And um, so the only thing that you really are comparing is how well on average the two groups do. Um, in comparison to each other. So randomization, super important, control, super important, uh, and replication. So that's it for today. Have a lovely afternoon and after evening, morning, whatever you're doing, uh, and I will see you later. Bye.